I don't think you ought to be anywhere real long without coming back to Philippians chapter 4. It's just good. More often you read it, it just gets gooder and gooder. Amen. The Apostle Paul writing to the folks there at Philippi, and he says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I want to look there again at verse number 6. It says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. I want to preach on this thought this morning. What happens when you pray? What happens when you pray? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word, and Lord, I just pray that you would bless now the reading and preaching of it, and I pray that you'd have your uh, hand on us, Lord, and, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in a way, Lord, that you would help us, and that you'd help us to understand, that you'd help us to be encouraged, and uh, Lord, that you'd help us to be more vigilant. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen and amen, and you can be seated. <clears throat> We pray for a lot of different things. Uh, I'd, I'd be probably embarrassed to share with you. I'm not embarrassed to share it with the Lord. Sometimes I'm embarrassed to share with others things I pray for. But I, I pray for a lot of things. The, the Bible says pray without ceasing. So uh, I can just kind of keep praying all the time and, and, and not close out that prayer. So as things come up, uh, you know, sometimes you're like, Lord, I hope I get an opportunity to talk to that person. Sometimes you're like, Lord, I hope I don't get an opportunity to talk to that person. And uh, Lord, I hope the light's green. And Lord, I hope that car doesn't actually pull out like it looks like they're about to and crash into my vehicle. Uh, Lord, I hope I don't lose traction going around this curve and, and just, you know, just little things. And um, phone rings. Lord, I hope it's that uh, call I was expecting. And just different, different, different things that we pray for. And... We pray throughout the day for people that are sick, people that are uh, going through trauma, pe people that are going through some rough spots in their life. And man, we know a lot of people going through rough patches right now. And uh, so we just keep those people in our prayers. We pray over our meals. That's how some people pray without ceasing. They just pray as they eat and they never stop. And um, <laughs> But have you ever thought about what happens when you pray? Some people are like, well, I know when I prayed, you know, and asked God to save me, I got saved. I know that happens when you pray. And um, I think some people are hoping that food magically changes. They, they pray and they're, they're hoping for some transubstantiation that, that, that uh, the Cheetos will turn into carrot sticks. Right after they, right after you swallow, not not before you swallow, but right after. But have you ever really just thought about what happens when when you pray? We're told to come boldly before the throne of grace. That doesn't mean come proudly before the throne of grace. We we come boldly not because of who we are, but because we know who He is. We come boldly because not of our abilities, but because of his abilities. We come boldly not because of our supply, but because of his supply. So we can come boldly before the throne. And, and thank God for that moment when Jesus died on the cross 
when the, the large curtain there that was blocking people out of the most holy place, the Bible says that it was rent, and it, as it was ripped, it, it came down from the top, from the bottom, so it wasn't a couple of mad disciples taking it out on the Jews who called for Jesus' death, who grabbed it at the bottom and just said, forget this stuff, and ripped it. It was God ripping it, saying now, we know that there's one God and there's one mediator between God and men. It's the man, Christ Jesus. And we have access to that mercy seat through Christ. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. We don't come in our own name. We don't come in our own will. We don't come in our own situation. We, we come in Jesus' name, knowing that he's at the right hand of the Father and he loves us. He loves us enough that he's promised that he was going to prepare a place and that if he left us to go prepare a place, which he has, that he would come again and take us to be where he is forever and ever and ever. And that's a blessing. He loves us. I love that song, He's Ever Interceding to the Father for his children. Man, what a, what a beautiful song. But he is our intercessor. You don't have to go and talk to a pervert in a, in a, in a phone booth somewhere. You don't have to sit somewhere and, and say, call on somebody and say, uh, you know, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And you got Father somebody over here when the Bible said don't call any man a father. And, and they, they want to be your mediator. And you've got to then go and, and, and make, do vain repetitions and say, so many our fathers and, and so many Hail Marys. Oh, our Father in heaven, which hallowed be thy name. And our Father in heaven, which hallowed be thy name. And you, and you just go through it systematically and just repetitively, just with your mind numbingly. You just you go through and your mind is just numb doing so many Our Fathers. And Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. And, and, and you're just repeating a bunch of words that is not communicating with God. Somebody says, but, but Jesus said to pray like this. He said, pray like this. You didn't have to repeat that same prayer every time you go. Can you imagine if your children came to you every day and were just robotic, even if they said something sweet to you. Good morning, mother. I love you so much. Pray for me as I go out for the day. And then they came to you the next morning. Good morning, mother. I love you. Pray for me as I go out for the day. Good morning, mother. I love you. Pray for me. After a while, you'd be like, you're just saying words. It's vain repetition. Give me something from the heart. Man, it's one thing, you know, when you're leaving out in the morning or whatever, and if anybody's awake, they're like, bye, Dad. Bye, Dad. Usually nobody's awake when I leave, but when I come home in, in the day, you know, teen, teenagers are the same, like, hey, Dad. Or, or, or else you just get the... <laughs> I pretend that that is, hello, Father. Thank you for serving our family by working all day. We love you so much. And just thank God for you coming home Amen. so we could be together as a family. It's all summed up in <laughs> Back off of their own thing. But what is sweet, what's really sweet, man, are, are, are the little guys that, that jump up and just run and almost tackle you at the door, you know. And so I've, I've started, I had to make sure years ago I stopped, I used to just come in if I was on the phone. I'd just walk on in the house and, you know, you're trying to mix and, People are trying to say hi, and you're trying to say bye. So now I just sit in my truck until it's time. But if I sit in my truck too long, the little guys get excited, and all of a sudden they're like hanging on the door. Dad, dad, you know, and they want you to come in. You're like, you're like, I need to get off the phone. But, you know, but it makes you feel loved. Somebody's glad you're there. Everybody likes to be loved. Just an expression. I mean, you feel snubbed if somebody just walks by and doesn't say anything to you. I try to speak to people as I go by. You don't want to be snubbed. I don't think our Heavenly Father wants to be snubbed. I think we go through our life and He's told us to pray without ceasing. And sometimes we've just ceased praying. Give Him a quick rub-a-dub-dub. -dub, Thanks for the grub. Amen. And we're done. And, or repetitive, now lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. And then we drift off to sleep before we can even finish. I believe our Heavenly Father wants fellowship from the heart with His people. 
I believe that because I'm a father and my heavenly father gave me the position of a father and I'm made in his image and I just believe that, that he gives us the emotions to feel that he wants us to feel and as a father I want to be loved and communicated with by my children. That reminds me to call my dad every once in a while. You know, is anything new? Nope. Is anything wrong? Nope. Sometimes some parents kind of cringe when their kids call because the only time they hear from them is when they're in trouble, when they need some money. You're looking at your phone going, I cannot afford to answer this phone call. <laughs> you know? I, I never have asked my daddy for money. I, I, I have an aunt that's like a second mama to me, and, and uh, I don't ever, never ask her for money, and uh, I always pay my own way, and I always do stuff, and when we go, you know, we go down there, they always want to pay for stuff. Aunt and uncle, you know, they always want to pay for everything. You go out to eat, and man, you, if you're going to buy dinner, you've got, you got to be slick. One of the boys is like, i got to go to the restroom. You know, you're like, here, go pay the bill while you're up there. And, and you've got to do something because, and then they're always like, well, we want to pay the bill. I, I don't want that relationship, you know, where they always, it's a one-sided relationship. I don't want to have a one-sided relationship, even, even with my parents. Uh, I believe that children can and should be a blessing to their parents and not just sponges that just show up and just suck the life out of them every time they come. Uh, and, and here's the deal. When it comes to our Heavenly Father, I don't want to go to Him in prayer just when I need something. But I'll tell you this. I, I believe this. God wants to hear from His children so much that if he only hears from you during times of tragedy, be ready for some tragedy when God wants to hear from you. But I, I like, I, I make extra sure I'm praising the Lord when good stuff happens because my Heavenly Father wants to hear from me. So I want to praise him for the good things and praise him for the blessings and, and thank him. Part of prayer should always be praising the Lord. Even in, even in a rough time, even if you're having to pray, you know, when you're going to the Lord, if your baby's sick, that's a scary time. But to be able to just say, Lord, I love you, and I know you love me, and thank you for being so good to me, and Lord, thank you for blessing, and God, you're just so amazingly good. Even in a, in a dark day like today, uh, Lord, you're, you're the light of my life, and we just thank you so much for Christ, and uh, he's the light of the world, and the God of our salvation, and Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us, and Lord, you know our baby's sick, and you know what's on our heart. And so even in, a, even in a time when somebody's sick, even when a relative passes, Father in heaven, we love you, and we know you love us, and we trust you. And Lord, as we say goodbye to Aunt Sally or Mama, thank you, Lord, for all the years and the time we've had together, and Father, I'm thankful to know their salvation. I'm, I'm thankful to know their testimony of salvation. I mean, there's a lot of thanking God. And, and now, Lord, would you help my heart? That, that empty spot that, that was filled by that person. Even as we go to the Lord asking him to help us in a broken heart, we still praise the Lord. Does that make sense to you? That, that really, it's very important that that makes sense to you because on our worst day, God is still real good. He's every bit as good as he is on your best day. When we're burying our parents, God is just as good on that day as he is the day that our children were born and we were rejoicing. We just need to be in that place where we're constantly praising the Lord as we talk to him. We need to, and, 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 and we need to stay in contact with him all the time. The Lord loves to hear from his people. Right there in, in verse number six, it says, be careful for nothing. Just You don't have to run around and worry about stuff all the time. You don't have to run around and worry. I, you know, the Bible is very clear that, I mean, he knows about a bird that dies and falls out of the sky. He clothes the flowers more elegantly than even King Solomon was, was arrayed in. He could take care of you real good. We sing that song, Consider the Lilies. They don't toil or spin. But even Solomon, he wasn't arrayed any greater than them. Man, that's just good. It's good to brag on God. 
The first thing that happens when we pray is that we have obeyed God's commands. We find here in Philippians 4, 6, the command to pray. Uh, and it's just one of many places. He says, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplications. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. So you've obeyed God's commands when you do that. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says simply pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. You go, when am I done praying? Well, when you're done living. When you're done living. As soon as you're done, just pray. Man, you know, I, was, I, I think about death just when you're a pastor, you, you think about it and where people are and things. And I've done a lot of funerals. I've done a lot more funerals than a lot of pastors. Uh, and I've had guys, friends of mine, that they're like, I've been pastoring 13 years. Have you ever done a funeral? I'm about to do my first funeral. I'm like, are you serious? Man, we were doing funerals before we started pastoring. And I've done hundreds, literally hundreds of funerals. I've done as many as three funerals in one week. And, and it does something to you after a while. You just kind of look at death. I don't look at death as this terrible end. I, I look at it as a door into what's next. So if I pass away, uh, people know Brother Graham, has got, he just finished singing that song. But at my funeral, he's going to sing, um, uh, Son, Go Bring My Children Home. And I want Brother Michael Wiggins to come and sing, I Just Started Living at my funeral. I love that song. I just started living, got me a brand new life, changed my direction. Man, I'm going to heaven. Hey, I will have just started living when we get to heaven. What a blessing. So just, hey, if, if I go before y'all, y'all just make sure you make those requests. Brother Graham's older than I am, so I'm going to go ahead and get him taped just in case. We'll, we'll record him just in case, you know. But man, you, I just want to have a life that's well spent. And part of that is obedience. It's obedience. And when we pray, we are obedient to God's command to pray. Isn't it good to be obedient? You can be obedient, just loving on God, bragging on God, and asking God for what you need. And secondly, not only are you obeying God's commands, <clears throat> secondly, you open God's treasury. You open God's treasury. My God owns a cattle on a thousand hills and he can throw a, a beef cell anytime he likes. You say, well, I asked God for a bunch of money and I didn't get it. Okay. That doesn't mean God doesn't... He, he owns everything. He owns the hills. He owns the, the gold in the hills. He, he owns all that stuff. And sometimes God protects us by not giving us what we ask for. Remember, remember uh, what do they call that, your first love? Aren't you glad you didn't get stuck with that one? You ever seen how some of those folks turned out? And you was praying, you're like, oh, I just pray that it'll work out. And now you look at them in life, you're like, oh, thank the Lord, that didn't work out. Oh, mercy. And you got stuck. But that, that's how it is sometimes, you know. That's why they call it first love. And uh, you just kind of you kind of get infatuated with somebody. Your heart is desperately wicked. It, your heart will deceive you. It will trick you. The devil will whisper in your ear. And man, I tell you what, after she's cussed you about twenty times, she ain't as pretty as she used to look at look like. Hey, when he beats you, he ain't quite as macho handsome as he used to look like. I'm telling you. Uh, God has a perfect plan. You need to make sure you're in, within God's perfect will as we move through life and, and do some things. But opens God's treasuries. Go to Jeremiah 33 real quick. We could literally preach about six or seven hours and, and not exhaust the thoughts of what happens when we pray. But in Jeremiah 33... Look, look at the first few verses there. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, 
to establish it, the Lord is his name. And then here's what he tells him, instructional-wise, in verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Wasn't that good? He says, hey, I know you're shut up in prison. I know you've got some things going on. I know things aren't that the way you want them to be. But call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things, things you don't even know about. I, I try not to limit God in prayer. I try not to limit God in prayer because he knows so much more than I do, and he has so much more than I can imagine. I don't ever want to say, Lord, I'd like to have three of whatever I need. God might be like, okay, well, I'll put the other 10 back then, I guess. I was going to give you 13 of them, you know. I, I don't, Lord, you know what I need, and Lord, I just want what you want me to have. I, I've just learned, listen, the last thing I want to do, that's not one of the last things I want to do, is get to heaven, get some rewards for things that we've done, and see a big giant pile and realize that was the storehouse that I could have had if I'd been more faithful, if I'd been more obedient, and if I'd prayed, if I'd prayed more. The Bible says you have not because you ask not, or you're asking amiss. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm saying, Lord, I just wish I had a few more dollars in my pocket right now because uh, I want to eat another tri triple cheeseburger. Well, God may not need me to eat another triple cheeseburger. The grease from it might slam my left ventricle shut, and then I'd be done early. And uh, it's not my time. But God knows what we need. And I tell you this, God has shown us some things just in our life that, that were beyond anything we could have ever imagined. Just beyond anything we could have ever imagined. Uh, God has given us friendships that are closer and more faithful and more honorable than anything we'd ever known before. We'd had buddies, but sometimes buddies walk away. I've had friends in the ministry. They ain't King James no more. We ain't buddies no more. You say, man, you'd, you'd, you'd quit having a friend? Doctrine is the decider. If you ain't got the right Bible, you ain't got the right doctrine. I don't, I just, I can be good acquaintances with people. But if you can't, if you, if you proclaim to be a Christian and you, don't, and you don't stick with the King James, you're living a lie. You're living in untruth. And I just can't be your friend. That's hard. I've cried some tears over that one. But doctrine is the decider. And you can't have right Bible doctrine if you don't have the right Bible. So we just have to take some stands in our lives. <clears throat> We're obedient to God's commands, but we open his treasury. He can show us great and mighty things that we know not. We don't even know those things. Go to um, Luke 11. Go to Luke 11. Look at, in Luke 11, look at verse number 9. It says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Do you understand that God has everything that we need? And I'm not talking about money. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. Um, but I'm saying God has everything you need. Do you know what most of the world, the world's not short on religion. Religion, whether it's flying an airplane into buildings, yelling aloha snack bar before you blow up a building or a bus or a car, trying to kill some Jews in Israel, whether... You know, whether you go back to, to older times and <clears throat> the world's never been 
out of religion. But what they don't have is peace. And God gives us that peace that passes all understanding. You know, you can go to places where religious leaders are buried. Uh, this last few weeks, we've had a bunch of people. I mean, as many as a dozen people we know in Israel. And whenever they go to the tomb, the supposed tomb where they believe Jesus was buried, it's empty. But you can go where Muhammad is, is buried. You can go where, uh, you know, Mary Baker Eddy is buried. You can go to where John Wesley is buried. You can go where all these religious leaders are buried, and they're still there. And in fact, in some places, they have armed guards protecting that. Why? Because their body's right there. And they have no peace. They, they don't offer peace. In our neighborhood, right here around our, our church property, uh, the Spanish-speaking Jehovah's Witnesses go up and down the road every day, knock, knocking on doors and, and talking to people. And they have no message of hope and peace. Ask them how to get to heaven. They'll tell you, you can't go to heaven. 144,000 have already gone. And you ain't one of them. So you're going to have to wait until the earth gets recycled and you can just stay here forever. I had one of them ask me one time if I wanted everlasting life. I said, not with a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'd rather go to heaven. Now you get involved with Mormonism. Mormonism. Some of the nicest people you'll ever meet are Mormons. They don't get people into a false cult by being rude. But they... You, you can sign up... <clears throat> You can go to the temple. You can get you a bicycle to ride around for a couple of years. You can get you some magic underwear. But you'll never have peace. You'll never have the peace that passes all understanding. In fact, they don't even offer you heaven. But if you work your way up, you can, you can become God yourself and get your own, uh, you can get your own planet. Our God supposedly is on, on Kolob. You go, that's crazy. I knew some Mormon people. They don't... If they believe what they believe, that's what they believe. Now, they don't just walk up and say, hey, you want to hear something crazy? If you could work your way up in our religion, you can get your own planet. Well, everybody would slam the door. That's not what those boys talk about. But you catch them out in a parking lot somewhere, riding their bikes and, and break open a conversation with them, and pretty soon they have somewhere they have to be. Same thing with, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, in our neighborhoods. You, you just, if you know some Bible, all of a sudden, uh, they've got somewhere they have to go, and then they're ready to leave. And they'll promise to come back, and they'll try to bring some uh, leader or higher up, and, and once you smoke them, then they've all got somewhere to go, and your, your house will be blacklisted. But they don't offer peace. They don't offer the peace that passes all understanding. They offer religion. You can get religion. They, they offer, you know, uh, a way to try to feel guilt-free. And you could sign up for that. Or you could sign up for the other. Who are the, um, some of the Hollywood folks are in that. And, uh, yeah, Scientology. You can sign up for that, and, and you, they'll give you nothing but guilt. And, uh, and it just they'll sign you up, and you'll never get out. And they'll blacklist you and take you away from your family and all that kind of stuff. It's just crazy. Listen, the world, there's no shortage of religion. I remember back in the 90s, religion, some crazy guy in a cult, everybody put on some brand new Nikes, I guess, so they could get traction. And when Haley's Comet came by, they, they, they put purple, purple triangles over them and brand new Nikes and took some poison hoping that their spirits could catch up with Haley's Comet and, and, uh, and go off to heaven. That's a dumb way to go to hell. That is a dumb way to go to hell. There's not a lot of smart ways to go to hell, but that's like extra credit. That's like you wanted to go to hell, and they're like, new Nikes, y'all get out of the way. Come on, no waiting in line for you guys. Come on through. I mean, that's just weird. You, you, you got joined up in some false cult, and that's like wanting to go to hell and not wanting to wait in line. That's weird, man. What the world needs is Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. The peace that passes all understanding. Hey, seek it and you'll find.
Ask. You'll get an answer every time. Knock and it'll be open to you. Pray. 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 We open God's treasury. God can give us anything he wants. Listen, if our children came, you go, well, I asked, preacher, and I didn't get enough money. Well, if it's all about money, you've got problems with that. Maybe God will give you some sense and, and help you understand that if you spend more than you bring in, you're going to have hard times. So what you got was worth more than a few bucks. Parents who give their children every single thing they want end up with children who never go away. If, if my kids heard the ice cream man coming by here and, they, and, I, and I thought it was okay for them to have an ice cream, I wouldn't give them $1,000 and say, go ahead and go, enjoy. I'd kind of estimate how much I think one ice cream cost. And I'd give them that. And that's how we do it. You know, God sometimes has to say no to us because he knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. Here's the question, though. Do you trust him? Because prayer opens his store, his treasury. Prayer opens his, his, his storehouse. And God can give anything he wants to give. So when he gives it to us, do we trust him or do we not? But I know this, you have not because you ask not. We've asked for some crazy things. My wife had a surgery and, and uh, we got a bill and it was like $48,000 It was something ridiculous. $48,000. Just add some more zeros behind there. That'll be fine. It'll get paid about as fast. $48,000. Who has that? And we just prayed. And all of a sudden, got another bill. It was a lot more manageable. We're 100 heirs. We can afford that one. And uh, God gives us what we need. And here's the deal. He knows what we need. Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Thirdly, not only does it obey God's commands when we pray, not only does it open God's treasury, but it opposes God's enemies. It opposes God's enemies when you pray. Do you realize Satan has given us every little doodad to keep us from praying? Satan has given us uh, traffic on the, on the eight every 10 minutes. We ain't got time to pray. We've got to listen to the traffic and the weather. We've got the morning news. We've got the Facebook. Man, we wake up in the morning. You've got to get on there and check and see what everybody did overnight. Did everybody wake up or did all my friends die? Let me see if they posted anything. I saw what they did right before they went to bed. Did anything exciting happen overnight? Let's see. They put pictures of their supper. Why have they not put pictures of breakfast up yet? What are they doing? You know, and why don't we get up and talk to the Lord? Satan gives us all kinds of things. He gives us rigorous schedules. We are so busy. Somebody asked me one time, they said, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm just super busy. They go, man, you must get a lot done. I said, oh, I didn't say I get a lot done. I'm just busy. There's a difference between being busy and effective. And sometimes I get so busy doing good things, I may not even complete the most important things. So we have to have some discernment. And listen, we just we pray about that. But it opposes God's enemy. Satan doesn't have to get you to look at porn and shoot heroin and murder people. Just quit praying. Just quit praying. Just get too busy to go to church. Just break that fellowship with, with, with the body of believers that God's put you in. You don't have to kill nobody. You don't have to take up cussing. You don't have to get drunk. You don't have to do that. Just stop praying. Psalm 34, 17 says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth out of all their troubles. The righteous. You say, well, sometimes I don't feel righteous. Well, you need to remember who you are. You're not self-righteous. But if you're saved, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed on you. 
Man, I'm so thankful. I love Bible truth and the fact that whenever I, I stand before my God, he's not going to see David Grice and all my failures. I, David Grice is so sorry, I'm going to have to get a new name when I get up there that only he knows. And he's going to see the blood of Jesus and I get a new name. Why? Because this filthy flesh named David Grice is worthless. In fact, I ain't even trying to take it to heaven. Y'all do what you want to with it when I'm gone. I don't care if you bury it in the ground. I don't care if you take it over and they, they, they you know, put it in the crematorium. I don't care if you donate it to science or science fiction. It doesn't matter to me. I'm done with it. When I'm done with it, I'm done. I don't care what you do. I'm going to heaven. And the Bible says that the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth out of all their troubles. Go over to Psalm 121. Look at another psalm. Psalm 121. Guys, I'm talking about what happens when you pray. Things start happening when you pray. I, I, we could have... 50 things. I mean, God inclines his ear. He listens. He's, he's right there. His eye comes. When you start praying, man, when, when, when the writers of Scripture said, guide me with thine eye. Listen, that's a prayer. That's when I look up to you. you I'm looking at you. you. You look. If you have children, you understand that, that when you have children, you just look at them and you can guide them with your eye. You're like, or, or, doing good. They hold the door open for somebody and say, thank you so much. And your son looks over at you like, you did good, son. Or they bonk one of their other brothers on the head and then look over at you and you're like. <laughs> and they're like, I I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're sorry, all right. Psalm 121, look at it. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he keepeth Israel, shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. From this time forth and even forevermore. Do you realize when you pray it opposes God's enemies? When David is writing and he says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's big. He's praying to God. And he said, My enemies are all around. So do I put on my armor and go, no, I'll just sit down and prepare a table for me. Howdy, boys. How's it going? All my enemies waiting to kill me. Sweet tea's real good today. God loves you. When we pray, it changes things. It can change our situation. It can change our future. The day we prayed for salvation, it changed our eternity. When we help others pray, it changes their eternity. Eternity! I'm not talking about getting us out of a rough spot. Oh Lord, don't let this storm knock my house down. Oh Lord, don't let that tornado be on my street. Oh Lord, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about eternity! Prayer changes eternity. Prayer gets the God of heaven involved in your situation. That's why we ought to be praying without ceasing. It opens, it obeys God's commands. It opens God's treasuries. And it opposes God's enemies. I don't know about you. I hate the devil. I hate the devil for what he's done in my life. I hate the devil for what he's done in family members' lives. I hate the devil for what he's done in some of y'all's lives. Hey, I hate the devil. And one of the greatest ways we can oppose him is simply to pray. 
Spend time fellowshipping with God. Spend time talking to the Lord. It could be, I know most folks' testimony here, but it could be somebody's here today and they've never trusted the Lord. You need to pray the most important prayer you will ever pray. One acknowledging that you have trusted in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. If you're here today and you don't have that peace that we talked about, you're not 100% sure what would happen five seconds after you died. Friend, won't you come and let us show you in the Bible how to be saved? The Bible way. I could just tell you, but I'd rather show you in the Bible so you know, you know it was directly from God. And for those that are saved, maybe it's time that we get back to praying like we should. Maybe it's time that we just make prayer and, and our fellowship with our God a priority. We can't do all of that today, but we can start it today with a decision. A decision. Now's the time to make a decision. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you just for being so good to us, even when we don't deserve it. Lord, I pray that even right now, if there's one here today that's not saved, that, that you'd burden their heart in such a way, Lord, they'd put their full faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the finished work of the blood of Christ on Calvary. And Lord, for saved folks, I pray that we'd make a conscious decision that this would be a line in the sand moment where we made prayer a priority once again. Lord, I just pray that you'd have your way and will in each of our lives. We love you and we thank you so much. We ask it in Jesus' name with thanksgiving.